We're here to praise, we're here to sing, we're also here to listen. We want to hear your word, so I pray, Father, that you would speak it to me, to each of us. Use the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, to communicate your message of truth to our lives. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We're continuing to learn to dance, the dance of life on God's great dance floor. I am alive, I come alive. And I hope uh, you're finding ways to put into practice the rhythms that we've been talking about this summer, the rhythm of gratitude, living each day, grateful for the blessings of that day, living with the rhythm of generosity, as God gives to us so that we can give to others, so that they can give to others, and that rhythm continues of give and take. What biblical practice and Bible word did we talk about last week? If you were here, what was the word? Anybody? Somebody? Sabbath. Yeah. Whoa, I was worried nobody remembered. Sabbath. Shabbat. Shabbos, as they say over in the Middle East, a day of rest. We talked last week about how God has given us that rhythm of work and rest. Working at uh, our life's purpose and career, and then a day to stop and focus on the one who has given us life and called us to that career. Sabbath. And I hope you went home and maybe talked about that with your family and talked about, it. guys, how can we practice Sabbath? We're busy. Things are going all week long. How can we put this Sabbath rhythm into practice in our lives? Today we're looking at another word and a practice. It's an unexpected key to finding life's rhythm. Some of you are probably going to think it's counterintuitive, counterproductive. But it's another Bible word like Sabbath that you don't hear anywhere else except probably in church or reading the Bible. It's a word tithe, tithing. If Sabbath refers to one day in seven, what percent does tithing deal with? One-tenth and what we do with that one-tenth. Tithing, like Sabbath-keeping, has its roots all the way back to earliest records. It even predates uh, Abraham, God's chosen people, the law of Moses. But we find in Genesis chapter 28 an example of one of the people receiving God's promise Jacob, Jacob is, he's on a journey. He has spent the night out alone under the sky. He found a stone that he'd laid out to put his head on for a pillow. And he had a dream. It's a fascinating dream. He dreamed there was a ladder going to, to heaven and angels ascending and descending. And he awoke and he realized that God had been here with him that night. So anyway, here's his response. Jacob made a solemn promise. If God is with me and protects me on this trip I'm taking and gives me bread to eat and clothes to wear and I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord, he will be my God. This stone that I've set up as a sacred pillar will be God's house and of everything you give me, I will give what? a tenth back to you. God, you will be my God, and as you prosper me, whatever you give me, I'll give a tenth back to you. Now, where did that come from? There was no law of Moses yet. There was no system of tithing set up yet. That wouldn't come for over another 400 years. It was built into human experience. 
It was something that God had destined us to put into practice. Now, obviously, God does not need your money. God, God does not need our crops. God does not need our herds or our flocks of sheep like Jacob was promising to give. God owns it all. He owns us too. He's given us life. So have you ever wondered why does God ask us to give him a tithe? Or why does God ask us to give anything at all? Why do we have this rhythm of tithing back to God? And that's what we want to look at this morning because there's some very, very profound reasons that will impact your life. Why we are told to give our tithes and offerings to God? First, it's for our sake. It's for us. We need to give. We're built in with a need to be generous. And when we don't do that, we shut down some important things in our life. Secondly, it shows where our allegiance is. It shows who we serve. And thirdly, it honors God because it acknowledges God as the giver of all of our blessings. And fourth, it is the key that unlocks life. It's the key. Not... Not the having of wealth, not the getting, but in freely giving it back as God shows us how to. That is when we begin to really experience life. Like with the Sabbath, we need to learn to practice this rhythm of life because it's how we're made to function. So let me explain. It's not the getting in life that is the ultimate blessing. I mean, we all like to do well. We all like to prosper. We, we all like to accumulate the things that money can buy. I mean, I'm not saying we don't like that. We enjoy that. We, we thank God for those things, don't we? But I want you to hear me here. It's not the getting that is the blessing. Or should we say, getting things is the blessing that leads us to the blessing. Because giving out of what we have, that is the blessing. Getting, receiving, having things, that is the test. Giving is passing the test. Giving is the key that unlocks the door to the life that is truly life. As the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and as our good gardener friend Ray told Frank about in the previous episode. Here's what he quoted to Frank in the soup kitchen. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, it says, Command those who are rich in the present world. Remember, he says, um, no offense, but that's you, Mr. Donovan. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. God provides these things for us to enjoy. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, now get this, in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Paul is saying here, this is the key to life, learning how to use generously what God has blessed us with. And Jesus had this to say about how we handle money, wealth, our prosperity. In Luke chapter 16, verse 10, Jesus says, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? 
And then Jesus says this. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money, both God and wealth, both God and things. So Jesus says here, we have to decide in life, are we going to be trustworthy with what God puts into our hands and use it in a way that blesses not on the, only us, but blesses others. Now, some of you may be surprised about this, what I'm just about to tell you. That nowhere in the New Testament is tithing commanded for the Christian. It's not a command. So you may be wondering, why are we talking about it? Why bring it up? Why would anyone willingly want to give away 10% of what they have, of everything they earn, to God? If they don't have to, if it's not a command, if it's not an obligation. And the answer will also likely surprise you because the people who have decided to do this and the people who practice tithing as a way of life do it because they want to. Because it comes from their heart. They do it because they feel like it's the expression of gratitude that they owe to God for all of his generosity. One of the fascinating things that I have been privileged to witness in each of the six churches that I've served is to encounter people in each one of those places who have told me how blessed they have been by practicing tithing in their life. I think back to those churches and I, th there are specific people who come to mind because in my time with them we had conversations and they shared with me that when they made the choice in their family that as they practiced stewardship they were going to give at least a tithe, the 10 percent, back to God. And I think of Larry and Susan in Nelsonville. I think of Robin in Belpre. I think of Matt, Mike, and Pat in Williamsburg, and Guy and Candy in Williamsburg. These people share stories with me how even when things were tight financially, and it would have been easy to say, I can't afford to give God 10%. They made that choice, and God blessed them through that. And numerous people here Responses on the giving intention card this past year that we uh, provide for you each year to, as you consider and, and determine for your own budgeting what your giving to the church will be. It indicates we have over 60 households who tithe, and that's just of those who return cards. I'm sure there are more. And every year, a few more check off that they have decided to begin that practice of tithing. And all these people give God the tithe, not because it's commanded, because they want to. It's how they express gratitude and allegiance to God. Think about it. If you as parents, you gave your kid $10 and say, all right, I want you to go buy me a gift. Pick out whatever you want, but get me a gift. And so you have to do it. That gift means nothing compared to if they have some money of their own or they take the time to make something for you or they give from their own heart. So God doesn't command this, but he has given us examples in Scripture that help us to know that this is a good place to start. And if our heart feels like this is something we want to give to show God our, our love, then it touches God's heart because he knows it comes from that motivation. For those of us who tithe, 
doing less under grace than what people before Christ did under the law just doesn't seem right. If the standard for giving to God under the law of Moses was 10%, why should I feel good about giving less? That's a question that I've considered. My dad was a pastor. He, he, he was pastor for 40 years. And he's told me a number of times that uh, one, of the, one of the favorite things that he preached on was giving. Stewardship, tithing. Now, I must confess, it wasn't one of the things that I was most inclined to preach about. I was a little bit reluctant to get on that subject, but Dad liked to. And I think it was because he knew that if people got that idea right, then they got what the Christian life is all about. If they get that, they get it. It's about living with a generous heart. So early on, I kind of shied away from preaching about giving and about tithing. But when I began to see the benefits, I had already experienced it in my own life. I, I told you a few weeks ago as a child, I, I delivered papers in the morning before school starting in fifth grade and going all the way through senior and high school. I mowed yards and shoveled snow. I did whatever I could to earn some extra money because there wasn't a lot of uh, discretionary money in our household. If I wanted money to buy something, I had to earn some. I shared back then that not only did it give me the opportunity to learn, to learn the joy of giving, of being able to go out and buy a gift for my mom or dad or somebody out of money I earned, I, I, I learned that that felt good. But when I began to practice tithing as a kid, and when I'd earned $10, I'd put $10, $1 in the offering plate, if I earned twenty dollars, I put two dollars. That felt good too. I felt like, man, I'm, I'm showing God that I really do appreciate Him. So, when I began to see the benefits, not only in my life but as other people shared with me, I thought, why am I not talking about this more to bring more people into this experience? A preacher not preaching on the benefits of tithing is like a doctor neglecting to tell you that it'd be a good thing for you to exercise more and eat right. A preacher not talking about the benefits and the rhythm of giving would be like a financial advisor not telling you, hey, it's a good thing as you're young to start putting away for retirement. Be like an auto mechanic not telling you that, hey, you know, you really ought to change the oil in your car and keep your wheels aligned. I mean, it just doesn't make sense that something that good, we don't share that. And it all seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? Doctor, you want me to exercise more, but I'm so tired at the end of, the, of a long day, I don't feel like exercising. Or I don't have money to set aside for retirement because I need it all right now. You know, it just doesn't seem like it makes sense, but it's all penny-wise and pound-foolish. And so it is with tithing. There is a rhythm to, of life to be discovered by each of us. The rhythm of giving God what we need to give Him. Not what He needs. God doesn't need anything from us. But what we need to give to Him. In Psalm 116, 12, it says, What can I give back to the Lord for all the good things He has done for me? That's a good question to ponder. What can I give back to the Lord for all the good things He has given to me? In Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, in the law of Moses, it lays out that a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. They lived then in an agrarian society. Everybody raised what they needed to eat, and they raised extra that they could trade with other people. But of every bushel of wheat that they raised, of every 10 bushels they raised, they'd give a, a bushel as a tithe to the Lord. Why are we told to give our tithes and offerings to the Lord? As we said, first, it is for our sake. 
because we need to give. We're made that way. It says in 1 Timothy 6.18, as we've already read, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. It's for our sake that we give because we discover life in being generous. And it shows where our allegiance is. It shows who we serve. Jesus says no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and wealth. Giving a tithe or even more shows honor to God. It acknowledges God as the giver of all of our blessings. And it is the key that unlocks life. Not the having of wealth. That's not the key that opens up fulfillment in life. But in freely being generous with it and giving it back as God shows us how. Because you see, you and I, we're all created in God's image. Right? That's what we believe. We believe that as human beings, we are bestowed, we have bestowed upon us part of the character, part of the nature of God. And prominent among that character is generosity. God loves to give. And he wants us to love to give. He wants us to have that heart. We're designed to live that way. And it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, you will be made rich in every way so that you can be what? So that you can be what? Generous in every way. This is how God wants it to work. Such generosity produces thanksgiving to God through us. Your ministry of this service to God's people isn't only fully meeting their needs, but it is also multiplying in many expressions of thanksgiving to God. He's talking about an offering that the church at Corinth has collected to send to the people who are suffering from famine in Jerusalem. And he's saying, God is blessing others through you and he's blessing you as you give generously. And it says, they will give honor to God for your obedience to your confession of Christ's gospel. They will do this because of your generosity and sharing with them and with everyone. Friends, God made us to live this way, to be generous. And that's generosity to each other, but it's also a generosity of giving back to God out of response to what he's given us. Just as Sabbath keeping, working six days and resting one in seven, however we can figure that out with our 21st century world and lifestyles. Just as that six days of rest of work and one day of rest is essential to finding our most efficient productivity as well as helping us to live lives with less stress, more freedom and joy. So likewise, tithing is a practice. It's a key to mastering the use of money in our lives. So I commend it to you to just consider, just like you did with Sabbath, talking about it as a family. As, as a family, consider what is appropriate for us to give back to God? And even though it may seem like a big step, I encourage you if your heart's tells you this is something we need to be doing. Trust that God will work to make it happen. You know, the people who share stories about tithing with me would tell me they come to the end of a week and not have enough money to pay the bills and the tithe. But they made that commitment and they paid the tithe and Invariably, God would provide a way to pay the bills as well. As we close this morning, I want to share this. We've been looking at the benefit to you as the one giving back to God. God blesses you in living in this rhythm. 
But let me remind you of how God uses our faithfulness in tithing. As we said, God doesn't need our money, but he wants to use our wealth and he wants to use our gifts to bless other people. That's how he works in the world we live in. And so, look around you. Think about all the, the rooms on this church campus, the children down the hall and kids on worship, the things that happen here during the week, the groups that meet here, the, the, the opportunities to come and have our faith nurtured and, and, and to explore um, the Christian life together in, in life groups. All of these things happen because your tithes and offerings provide the place and the staff and the, the uh, programming to do that. Let me quickly share just three examples that have happened, one this week, one last week, and one two weeks ago, to show the impact that Grace Church has on lives. Tuesday evening, I was down at the other end, and you all may not uh, be able to relate to this unless you've been down there, but at the other end, when people go out of the sanctuary after worshiping on Sunday morning and they're going out the doors, up over top of the doors, it says, let's dance. We've got those letters cut out and applied up there. A man was sitting out there in, in the narthex waiting for his son who was here for a scout computer training, I think working on a merit badge. And they were in the classroom right next door. And he saw me going back and forth as I was uh, greeting the parents of the four-year-old preschoolers. That's another thing that goes on here. And he says, could I ask you a question? And I said, sure. He says, what's that? And he pointed up to the words above the door, let's dance. He said, what's, what's that all about? I said, well, you know, that's, that's a theme that we've had this summer. We've been talking about the rhythms of life and how if you live in, if you get in step with the right rhythm, it's, it's like a dance, you know, and we're, we're talking about let's dance the dance of life that God's called us to. And I, I gave him one of these cards that kind of uh, gave the introduction to it. He said, you know, I don't go to church here. I go to a Episcopal church over in Maumee, but it seems like this church really has an impact on the community. I said, well, that's what we hope to do. That's what we're here to do. And it's good to hear from you that it seems like we do. We had that. The week before that, we had a praise and worship service in here on a Wednesday evening that Sophie put together and led for us. And several people in that service, when given the opportunity to express what has touched their lives recently, expressed how the ministries of this church and the caring of this church and the hospitality of this church has helped them and brought them in uh, to this fellowship. And then two weeks ago, I had a young man sit in my office. He called and asked if he could meet with me. He grew up here, went through confirmation, was in youth group, and when he graduated from high school, he helped out with youth group, worked in our youth ministry. He finished college, he entered the military, and he was coming back to my office because he wanted uh, me to, to get my advice as he prepares to go into the chaplaincy in the army. He grew up in this church. He was nurtured in his faith. It became stronger as an adult. Now he wants to use it in ministry in the military. That's just to share with you how God uses the tithes and offerings that you bring. You get blessed, and other people get blessed. I'd say that's a win-win, right? God doesn't need your tithes, but you need to give from your heart. And so the dance goes on. Let's dance. Would you pray with me, please? God, may we have generous hearts. May our motivation be not to see how little we can give and be satisfied, but how much we can give and be fulfilled. Guide us in that decision of stewardship. It's something we all have to 
think about and come to a conclusion about. But as we do, Lord, help us to get into the rhythm that you want for our lives that will enable life to be at its fullest and most meaningful. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.